welcome back. We have a quiz up here. So if you can answer these questions in the comments box, we're going to do a drawing for a free t-shirt. So make sure you get all the answers right, but no cheating. You may not ask Siri or Google what the answers are. So put those answers in the comment box and we'll get started here in a minute. everybody um, it's me Jamie at the Outdoor Learning Center and I have my dear friend Robbie here we're excited you guys are back today we're going to be talking about ants bees and wasps um, Robbie and I are going to talk for a little bit about ants and wasps and then we have some special guests today from Tate's Honey Farm and they're going to talk to us all about honeybees so if you guys can hang out during our slideshow we're going to actually show you some real live honeybees who are actually making honey so without further ado, let's get started. Oh wait, Robbie, how was your week? I Good. forgot to ask. Good. This What'd you do? I did a lot of research for this. this oh, excellent. Week, so. Yeah, guys, this was a new topic for us here at the Outdoor Learning Center, so we actually learned a lot. In fact, the questions that we showed you, I had never seen before. Yeah. So I learned new stuff. I learned all these this week, so. So just so you guys know, you can always learn something new. Just because we're old, well, I'm old, Robbie's not old. Not quite as old. I learned new stuff this week. So, let's get started. So, we're going to talk about ants and bees and wasps. Like I mentioned, they are insects. We talked earlier in the lives that they actually have three body parts, uh, antenna. So, these guys are insects. They move all over the world, most places and they are really important to our environment. So without these insects, we probably don't have any of the food that we want to eat. They're good food for other things, and as like I mentioned before, they are good pollinators. Uh, so ants are very social insects that are related to bees and wasps and they began to populate the earth way down in the Cretaceous period. So you can see in the bottom right all those old, old ages that we used to live in. Well, we didn't used to live in all of them. <laughs> Dinosaurs used to live back in the Cretaceous and Jurassic period. So uh, ants began to, to come around in the Cretaceous period. Uh, they evolved from prehistoric wasps and began to diversify as plants became more diverse. Uh, so today there is an estimated 22,000 species of ants, ranging from the thief ant, which is only about 1.5 millimeters long, to the queen driver ant, which is two inches long, uh, which makes the queen driver ant 34 times larger than the thief ant. Hey, Robbie, I found out some cool stuff about the ants you mentioned. What I'm going to show out? you a picture. Well, I did find out some cool stuff. So this is the thief ant that you mentioned before. Um, and they got their names from their habit of nesting close to other ants, and they steal the other ants' food. They're also called grease ants because they're attracted to grease. So if you don't want these ants in your house, make sure you don't leave your grease out. And then you also mentioned the queen drover ant. Um, this is a huge ant. I put a ruler there, and you mentioned it was 34 times larger than the thief ant. Mm -hmm. uh, it lives in Africa, so and when supplies come short, they leave their ant hill and they march up to what's that number, Robbie? Uh, is that like fifty million? That is fifty million. Is that insane? That's a lot of ants. Fifty million ants marching. There's a picture of it up there, um, and people could get around them pretty easily, uh, and they can go about twenty meters in an hour. And twenty meters is about as long as the school bus is there. So if you can imagine your school bus. 
Alright, so like Jamie said, ants, they usually live in what's called a colony. Um, they can be as small as a few dozen ants um, to colonies that spread across miles underground and are home to millions upon millions of ants. Um, large colonies have sterile, wingless female ants that are workers and soldiers for the colony, and they also build the tunnels and gather the food. Um, they'll also have male, male drones and then a female queen where all the eggs come from to grow the colony. Uh, scientists refer to ants as uh, super organisms because all the ants op operate as a unified entity to support the colony. So ants have several different ways of getting their food, either through being a predator, so they're gonna hunt other insects, they might scavenge, so they'll, they'll get like dead and decaying leaves and things, um, or they have other methods. Um, so scientists believe that many ant species have special little things in their stomach that help them get extra nutrients out of the plants that they eat. Uh, leaf cutter ants, in fact, they eat a special fungus that only grows in their colony. Um, so uh, what they do is they have basically a compost bin in their colony where they continually bring leaves and decaying matter and they grow with what they call a fungal garden. So uh, we're gonna show you a little video here about these leaf cutter ants. looking at some of the world's earliest and most competent farmers. These leaf cutter ants make humans look like newbies. We've been farming for 12,000 years. Ants have been doing it for 60 million. We developed plows and shovels. Ants use their own bodies. Their mandibles are shears that cut through leaves with incredible efficiency. The ants drink the sap in the leaves for energy, but they don't eat them. Remember, they're farming here. They're using the leaves to grow something else. But first, they have to haul the gigantic leaf pieces away. This is no small matter. For a human, it would be like carrying more than 600 pounds between our teeth. Then, they clean the leaves. They crush them cut them into little pieces, arrange them carefully in stacks. They even compost the leaves with a little of their own poop. They spread spores around like seeds. Over time, a fungus grows. And that, this highly nutritious fungus, that's what the ants are after. They feed it to the colony's offspring, millions of them. For humans, farming was the origin of our civilization. And it's the same for ants. They are fungus tycoons. Their colonies are true underground cities with a bottomless need for resources. Having this reliable source of food has given them the luxury to specialize. Leafcutter ants have the most complex division of labor of any ants. There are tiny worker ants and large worker ants and enormous half-inch long soldiers that protect the colony. Like human farmers, their abundant food sources made leafcutter ants very, very successful. And this is where two civilizations, ant and human, collide. From Texas to South America, leafcutter ants are huge agricultural pests. Working stealthily at night, they can strip an entire tree of its best leaves in just hours. As their ant civilization grows, they build up the soil in the tropical forest, but they also pose a threat to those around them. And in this way, we resemble them more than we might like to admit. So ants do have benefits they give to us. 
Um, they actually help to aerate the soil, which makes the stuff grow better. Um, they're actually using them in China to help them control other pests. They do get into houses and buildings and can become a pest themselves. In South Africa, ants are used to help harvest seeds from plants to make a tea. And by having ants collect the seeds into piles where humans can gather them up, collecting almost half a pound in a single heap. So they're really good workers. Ants and their eggs can be eaten. We mentioned uh, that, gosh, the insect show. Um, they uh, are a food. I can't think of what the name of it was, though. Do you remember the name of it? Somebody pipe in what the name is. People that eat in in insects for food. Um, in Colombia, they're toasted alive and eaten like peanuts, if you can imagine. And in Asia, the green weaver ant paste is served with curry. Their eggs are often used in Thai salads. And someone asked a question about how strong ants are. We are going to talk about that in just a minute. Oh. It's estimated there's about a million ants for every human on Earth. So that equals 10 quadrillion ants on Earth. They're really strong for their size. They can carry up to 50 times their body weight. That would be like an average male human being able to lift a semi-truck. That's how, how they're able to forage so much food and move things that don't seem like they'd be able to move. And Robbie, why do you think they're so strong? I don't know why. Do you know why? I have no idea. It must be their structure of their body. They're not carrying trucks though, just so you know. It's just how they're designed. Perfect little levers and fulcrums. Um, and they're found in entertainment. So if you guys are bored on this rainy day, Maybe you haven't seen Ant Bully, A uh, Bug's Life, or Ants. Those are all movies about ants. So we're going to move on to talking about wasps. Just before I do that, oh. so I do know the reason why ants can lift a lot. Oh, here goes Robbie. So this is from my research, so it may be incorrect. but <laughs> uh, So the way they're, the ants are, they, they don't use their muscles to hold anything together inside their bodies oh. so they can use all their muscle mass to like lift things so our muscles are always working to like hold our organs in place right. and make sure we're breathing and stuff mm -hmm. ants don't have to do that so they can use all their awesome thanks robbie exactly so we're gonna talk about wasps robbie what do you right. know so a wasp is any narrow waisted insect that is in the same family as ants bees and wasps but it's not a bee or an ant um, so the most common types of wasps that people usually identify are yellow jackets and hornets. Um, like bees and ants, uh, they live in a colony in a nest, and they have an egg-laying queen, workers, drones, and soldiers. Um, wasps play many ecological roles, ranging from predator to pollinator to parasite. Um, in the case of parasitism, which is, which is what, it, what it means when something is a parasite, um, these wasps lay their eggs in or on another insect, which in turn, unlike most other parasites, kills the host. So the host is what you would call the insect where they laid their eggs. Um, solitary wasps are parasites to most pest insects, so these wasps can actually be very helpful in a greenhouse or a garden. Um, like bees, there are tens and thousands of different species and they live everywhere but polar regions. So, Robbie, the picture on the left there, mm -hmm. those are actually insect larvae and living inside of that thing. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want that gross yeah. out, but it's cool, too. Par parasitism is a very cool thing in nature. And then somebody just piped in entomophagy. No, entomophagy. We had a hard time saying that word. That's the act of eating insects. Thanks, Kathy, for figuring that out for me. I didn't pronounce it right. Sorry, Robbie, to cut you off there. You're all good. So, of social wasps, um, the Asian great hornet, aka the murder hornet, we've been hearing so much about, is the largest wasp in the world. So it measures about two inches long. Um, and then solitary wasps, that is the largest, it's called the tarantula hawk. Um, I believe that's the one on the bottom yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, it measures in at about uh, two inches long as well. And then the giant scoclid, sclolid wasp. I don't know how to say that one. It's real <laughs> tough. Um, but it's native to Sumatra and Java. Uh, so those are by India. They, they measure about two inches long as well. Um, so they, 
the wasps appear a little bit before bees. Um, so they, they appear in the, the fossil record in the Jurassic period, and then in the Cretaceous period, they became a lot more diverse. Um, so we'll, we'll post a link for this, but in eastern Washington, there are a ton of wasps. Um, on this list, I think there was like 20, 25 different wasps that I, I counted. Um, but uh, some common ones that you'll see are the western yellow jacket. Um, those ones are yellow and black, and they have a striped abdomen. Um, and they'll usually nest in crevices or on tree branches. Um, and then the northern yellow jacket is a little bit smaller and is white instead of yellow. Um, and they build similar nests and like to sting as well. Hey Robin, before I move on, I want to remind you guys, if you have any questions for our honeybee farmers, we're going to be logging on with them in just a second. So make sure you're asking questions about honeybees. Um, so uh, there are a few different kinds of paper wasp that live uh, in eastern Washington. Mainly the golden paper wasp, which is the one we see here, uh, and the western paper wasps. Um, so paper wasps, the western paper wasp in particular, um, they have much like all the other bees and everything like that, they have the, the hexagon shaped hives um, and they kind of look like what I think about when I think of a wasp. Um, kind of that bright yellow, bright black. Um, yep, exactly that right there. Um, so uh, they're very territorial. So um, like some hornets or anything like that, they'll, they'll kind of be aggressive and, and seek to attack. They'll, these guys will only attack um, if they feel threatened or if they feel their nest is threatened. So if you're freaking out, yeah, so, they're flying around you? Yeah, so exactly. If a bee, a wasp like this is flying around you, it's probably most likely not going to attack you unless you panic and try to hit it. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, and some people are allergic. Yes, yeah, so I was about to, about to say that. So some people can have anaphylactic reactions. So um, that just means that kind of their breathing to your your windpipe will close up and you can't breathe. Um, I know my dad would would do that. I'm pretty sure I'd go into anaphylactic shock if I got stung. So yeah, we go hiking with kids a lot. And we have to carry epipens for them, so mm -hmm. it's a real scary thing. So most people don't want them around their house, um, and for good reason, especially if they're deadly. Um, and so there's actually a study conducted on European paper wasps, um, and they discovered that bees that were a little bit brighter were actually more venomous and so the brighter colors acted as a warning um, that it was a little bit more venomous than the other ones. Um, but most wasps are beneficial in their natural habitat um, except for places where it's kind of a nuisance to humans and like bees they're pollinators but not quite as much as pollinators as bees are. So we're going to watch a quick video before we have the beekeepers um, I thought this was awesome when we were talking about with these guys about something cool that honeybees do and then we're going to start uh, interviewing our honeybees, honeybee keepers, make sure you guys are asking questions for them. And that didn't work. We'll go back. Honeybee workers are able... Oh, jeez. Technology is tough for me. Honeybee workers are able to send complex messages to one another. In the wild, they sometimes nest out in the open, but mankind has persuaded them to live and store their honey in hives. The colonist's heart is its queen. She is just a little bigger than her subjects and mother of them all. Honeybees are in the spring, when food stocks are low, the workers get busy collecting nectar. They have a remarkable method of telling one another where to find the most productive flowers. It's called the Wackle Dance. This returning bee has just found a new source of nectar and is going to tell others in the hive about it. First, she gathers. 
gathers an audience. To do that, she climbs on her sister's backs and vibrates her abdomen. Now that she's got their attention, she begins her dance using a code of movements that tell her fellow workers where her discovery lies. The duration of her waggle indicates the distance to the nectar source. The longer the waggle, the further the flower. And the ankle at which she dances across the cone tells them the direction to the flower in relation to the sun. Her instructions are remarkably accurate and can pinpoint the location of a nectar source over six kilometers away. Some of her fellow workers set off immediately to find it. In one short season, the colonist workers will visit up to 500 million flowers and will... Okay, I'm going to pause it there and we're going to transition and actually meet some real critters and some real bees. Let us get our technology figured out here. So we have Donnie and Ian uh, Howitt from Tate Honey Farm. Am I saying it right? Yep. Right. And the best thing is you guys are West Valley kids. Correct. I'm a senior, sophomore. Sweet. So, uh, and you guys are just down the street from us, like less yep. than a half mile, maybe. Yeah, right on the river. Sweet. So I'm just going to turn it over to them, and they're going to talk to you about honeybees. Make sure you guys are asking questions, and we'll be answering those questions, or they're going to hopefully answer their questions. Thanks for being here, guys. We really appreciate it. Yep. All right. So uh, right here, we got a frame that we pulled out of a hive this morning. Uh, it's a frame that is mostly made up of brood, which is what we classify as anything from eggs to larva to cat brood, which is just brood right before it hatches and new bees form. And uh, on this frame, we have a queen bee. Uh, she might be hiding she's right, right here. Yep, she's, she's right marked. there with the blue dot. Yep, she's marked with the blue dot, so she's really easy to find. And the people who we buy the queens from, they'll actually do that for us, kind of helping us out, making it easy to find them. When How do you paint a bee? Well, uh, what they do yeah. is they have ladies that uh, pull them off of the branches barehanded in the orchards that they go into, and they put them into a little plunger device with a foam insert on it, and they just push it up to the little holes on the top, and they just yeah. use a little paint marker. And That's awesome. Down. Yeah, and there's a little, here's a little cage with one with, um, with a more ice cube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... Uh probably a little bit better way is to see. Is that cage just so you could show her to us or is that how no. you sell her yeah, or something? Yeah, this is how okay. we, we sell them and they only come, it's usually they come with just the queen, but if people are not going to put them in the hive within a couple hours, we'll put workers in there just to help her. With, because she, she, she won't be able to survive on the yeah. for And can you tell me how much it would cost me to buy the queen? So, yeah, uh, it's $45. So if you're looking to get yourself a new hive, just come on down and get something <laughs> But yeah, basically we got some brood right here. They're doing, they got this weird kind of um, pattern about them leaving this space open. That's where the queen, that's where brood just hatched out. It, the and queen, what's a brood again? That's the larva. So the larva just hatched out of right here. There's still some right here that you can't probably really see that well. Um, if you get real close, it's right there. The bees are just covering it. But the queen will eventually come back here, and I think she's already started doing it, laying some more eggs. Um, right now, she's kind of just poking her head through the cells and looking for good places that she can lay. And basically, all these bees are on top. Just There's nurse bees and worker bees, and they're just helping feeding the, the young larvae, trying to keep them healthy uh, in preparation for them hatching out. So, um, yeah, it's... We had a process. couple questions come in. Ian, do you want to read those? Uh, yeah, the first one was how big the honey bee nest get. And uh, as far as scale goes, uh, when we start out our hives, they come in a little three pound package of bees with the queen. And that's around 10,000 bees or so. And that covers only four frames in the hive. So four of these. And in the end, when we, we have two brood boxes, which are the deep frames like this that are for laying brood on for the queen. And we have 16 frames total in the box for that all year round. And then once the honey flow starts, which is when flowers start producing a lot of nectar and the honeys can, and the bees can go gather it, is when um, we start adding more boxes with shorter frames because that disrupts the queen's natural laying pattern of wanting to lay in a circle. 
So when she has a shorter frame, she doesn't want to lay on it. So we stack those boxes on top, and we can get anywhere from one honey super on top to three or four. Yeah. That's awesome. And then we have another question. Don, you want to read that one? The next question is, do you recommend people house bees, and how far is it to get started? I asked the same question this yep. morning. That's a great so question. We, uh, we do recommend. We get a lot of new beekeepers every year. Uh, it's probably best you check with your neighbors and make sure they're okay with it. Um, but yeah, we get a lot of new beekeepers. We post videos to keep you guys kind of knowing what to do. But it's actually a pretty easy process. You just kind of got to check it weekly, make sure the bees are doing all good. And then uh, what was the second part of it? Um, we have more questions. Okay. Oh, if you should have them. That answered it, I think. Do you and then, or how hard is it to get started? How hard is it? Um, I think it's all just about how diligent you are with keeping your bees, like checking your bees, making sure that they're fed well and that they're treated well, making sure that, yeah, just always kind of keeping an eye out. And I was asking, because we're a very busy family, and you were saying like once a week during mm -hmm. the active time, yeah. you're out there once a week checking on them. Mm -hmm. And then when the season goes, there's some cleanup and mm -hmm. ordering for or organizing. So yeah. you're saying like one to two weeks, or one to, one to two days, one to two hours, how long? During that, does it take you to um, feed them and check on them each? At the beginning of the year, it'll probably take you around an hour to really go through it because the thing is, you're trying to find eggs at the start. Okay. And eggs are really small and they're really hard mm -hmm. to see, so it's going to take a while to get accustomed to finding them. But uh, once you get past that, it's really a lot less uh, okay. concerning. And it's more stable. Yeah. Cool, cool. It gets easier as you go. Okay. Um, and another one was how do you know if it's a queen? Uh, for our queens, they're marked, so they got a colored dot on all of them, and the colored dot signifies which year of the queen it is. Um, so this year is blue, the year before was green, the year before that was red, and there's none alive from the year before that. Awesome. So, um, and besides that, they're a lot bigger and longer and fatter than all yeah. the other bees, and their movement pattern is different. Yeah. So they push other bees out of the way, and they move a lot faster. Yeah, you can, yeah. So it's really... I mean, it's right there compared to the other guys. It's it's a lot bigger, and they're different colors too. So you can see her just push all those bees out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> I like her. Yeah. <laughs> and another question was, do queen bees control all the other bees? And uh, short answer uh, is yes. Uh, the whole hive is really just trying to supplement the progress of the queen bees. So their ultimate goal is to just become stronger, and the only way they can do that is through the queen bee. Yep. Yeah. How big do honeybees get? Uh, so you'll notice when a bee is recently hatched out that it's pretty small. But um, basically what you see here, that's about how big they're going to get. Um, probably about half an inch, maybe. Not even. I would say probably half an inch. But um, yeah, the queens are definitely the bigger part of the, the bees. Um, yeah. How long and how many bees does it take to produce one cup of honey? Oh boy, I don't know the exact um, scale ratio for bees to honey, but I can tell you that if you're a new beekeeper and you're starting out and you do everything, you can probably get upwards of 50 pounds of honey with minimal, minimal work, which is pretty good. And you guys sell the honey at the we'll farm? Sell the honey, yep. Okay. We, I think last year, from just our honey that we extracted, we got four Three, barrel fulls, yeah, which are barrels. each. 55 gallons each. Whoa! Five so we pounds. run 75 hives at the most. So we got like 2,000 pounds of honey last, last, last harvest. And so if people want to get honey from you, we're going to post the link on our Facebook page and then also on our YouTube channel and okay. they can call you or yep. I don't know if yeah. you guys are open right now Saturday, during our Saturday. Saturdays. Saturday. 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 Okay. Okay. Do we have some more questions out there, Tiffany? What, do, what else do you think that we should know about the importance of bees for our world? Can you tell us that? Uh, I would just say bees are the prime pollinator of agriculture. If you don't have bees, half the stuff that we eat on our plates every dinner is not going to be Probably there. more than half. More than half, yeah. Because the animals that we eat yeah. eat the things of the exactly. bees, yeah. So, even up at Green Bluff, I mean, we alone put probably 25, 30 hives up on Green Bluff just to pollinate some of the orchards up there. So, without that. So, they hire your bees to come pollinate their plants, right. not uh, for honey, but yeah. to actual work, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're a lot more important than I think a lot of people think. So, it's, it's more valuable for them to pay us to get it up there than it is 
economically for us to yeah. put these awesome. up there. Mm -hmm. So what are some threats to your honeybees? I mean, people have been talking about the murder wasp, do you worry, or horn hornet. Yeah. Tell so us about that. That thing, um, what, what it does is it'll sit in front of a hive of bees, and it'll, two or three of them, and it'll just start decapitating bees and eating their bodies. Yep, and then I'll feed it to their, their nest. And basically that's the worry with all, the whole country right now, but as of right now, there's been only one case of a dead murder hornet found in Seattle, I think it was. I think it was Wacom, north somewhere, of Seattle, yeah. Somewhere over there. But um, it's very it's very unlikely that they'll make it to Spokane or even this side of the, of the state because it's going to be almost impossible for them to get over the Cascades and they like the humidity over there and how wet it is. So. And so another threat would be, I was thinking about like Green Bluff, they need, bees need plants, right? Yeah. Like, and so if we're not planting native plants and things like that. What do you guys know about that? Uh, well, what, what we typically recommend for people who are doing their own beekeeping is to go and get like a wildflower mix. Just You can get them real cheap at any gardening store. You can just scatter them throughout your yard. And cool. I really like that stuff. And it's really good. So. Another, another threat I would say, this is just kind of on the topic of our hives up in the orchards, is just the pesticides that farmers will put on the um, on the apple trees and the cherry trees, I guess. Um, we always have the orchardists kind of fertilize and put stuff on their uh, trees like probably two or three days before we go up there and put our hives in there just because if bees are going on there and pollinating the plants that have already had pesticides on them, they're probably not going to... And Donnie, maybe for kids that don't know, what is a pesticide? That's uh, just something that helps the plant grow. It, it, it's made to kill the insects. That yeah, so it's like yeah. a poison yeah. that you put so they don't want to, their aphids to eat all their fruit yeah. they're going to happen. And so if that pesticide gets onto the honeybee, it can kill them, right? Correct. Okay. It is kind of bee. Um, honeybee? Yeah. Uh, probably of the different varieties. Uh, the drone. drone is probably the drones biggest. Are the drones are big and fat. I don't think we got any in this hive because the queen is already mated, so they're not really producing any there drones. Might be a couple here. But um, yeah, it's it's like it looks almost it's almost really uh, it's, it's tricky when you when you're trying to find a queen in a hive and there's a ton of drones because the drone the drone looks like the queen but it's uh, it's a little bigger and fatter they, they got, got bigger big old, heads yeah they got big old they look like eyes but they just got a big old head and as far as like bee species I'm pretty sure the bumblebee is it's pretty big, big. yeah but um, Do people use they don't use bumblebees do no. they okay. Uh, These are honeybees that honey make bees. honey. Yep. Okay. I think uh, they're carnion bees yeah. too. We, so yeah, the ones that we kind of differentiate are carnolian as pathogen. So this is a carnolian queen. Cool. So you guys purchase your queen from other people? Correct. Yeah, down in California. Yeah. So what happens? Do you, do you ever have queens that are born out of your larva? Yep. So uh, they, yeah, they'll you like make like the workers will make queen cells. Okay. And if you let them keep working on it, eventually a virgin queen will come out. Okay. And then drones will have to mate with the queen in order for the queen to start laying. Oh. Yeah. Will and she then, go form her own hive? No. Uh, usually, oh. her and the old queen will duke it out. The young queen, <laughs> queen always wins. The really? Yeah, kind of yeah. like my house. Yeah. The young queen always wins the battle. Oh yeah. Um. Well, we have another question, but it's more about. Oh wait, we got. Here comes the question. Oh. Okay. Can all types of bees sting? Drones cannot. Yeah, so the ones we were just talking about, the ones with the big heads, those are purely born to mate with the queen, and after they mate, they have no purpose in the hive. <laughs> they don't even go out to, they don't even go out to forge and get honey or nectar. They are just mooching off the honey that the worker bees have already brought. In. Oh they my are, goodness! They don't sting, and they're pointless within the hive. Um, but yeah. And uh, uh, how do bees make honey? Was another question that we got. And uh, bees make honey by going out to different flowers around the hive, and they take the nectar from the flowers, and they put it in these different cells in the hive, and then eventually, once they fill it up, they cap it over with wax to store it. Yep. That's awesome. They use it, they'll eat the pollen and the honey for protein and all that. So. Cool. Do you guys have different flavors of honey? That's my last question from uh, me. <laughs> So based we, on we something, used right? To, um, but now we don't really have any specialized because we don't really have a yard that is completely surrounded by one type of plant. Okay. Bees will fly anywhere from one to three-ish miles well, I was of, wondering, yeah. in a radius around the hive. 
So it's really difficult to control the crop in that Okay. Way. The only different flavors you have is if you buy some honey sticks. If okay. You know, like sour strawberry and raspberry. Yeah, we get those at the apple. fair. Yeah. That's the only type of different honey you got. And they, I've heard that they, if you eat local honey, you have better uh, allergy stuff too. Yeah, because a lot of people you get the local pollen variety. Yeah. And yeah. A lot of people just eat honey. So if you have food. allergies, seasonal allergies, buy Tate Honey Farm That's honey. Yep. Yeah. I got yeah. allergies in the honey house. Awesome. Then it's not a pill you have to take every day. It's na right. natural. So right. uh, thank you guys so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going to come stand by you, Ian, but scoot over by your brother because you guys live together. Um, and we have some friends I want to say hi to. So we have Annika, Linnea, Bo, Ellen, Jamie, Levi, Ava, Dick, Joanne, Drew Holiday, Kellen, Nancy, Victoria, Parker, and Lena, Mr. Collins, and TJ, I'm sure, Kim, Christopher, Mr. Spanish and Avery, Tay, hello, Hazen, Brad, Mindy, and Maddie. Um, we did get some really cool email uh, that we're gonna post on our Facebook that Avista Utilities put out about the importance of honeybees and what we can do in our neighborhoods to help them. Uh, and I'm gonna have this pan back over. Robbie, can you go next slide for me? And we're gonna look at the screen, Jasper. So next time we're gonna be talking about beavers. That was one of the things that you guys voted on. Um, we're going to be interviewing a local author named Ben Goldfarb. He's going to zoom in with us. And he actually wrote a book called Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. It's a story about the world's most influential species of how North America was colonized, how our landscapes have changed over centuries, and how beavers can help us fight drought, flooding, wildfire, extinction, and the ravages of climate change. It's about how we could coexist with beavers and how fel these fellow travelers move around the planet. He's gonna be answering questions. So our task for all of you guys that are watching this live or watching us on YouTube is we wanna know what questions you have about beavers. So we're gonna do this as an interview more than our normal live comments. We'll have some chance for live comment but I want to be able to ask him questions about what you are wondering about beavers. So make sure you guys are sending us your questions either via email or commenting on this post or on our YouTube page, um, YouTube channel. I'm so old. Anyway, safe, safe yeah. Um, but yeah, next week will be all about beavers and send us your questions. We miss you guys. Thank you for logging on and watching these lives. It gives us purpose and Robbie and I have a fun time researching so it gives us things to do all week and think about. I want to thank Tiffany once again, who's answering questions, uh, and most importantly, the Tate Farm guys for being here, Donovan and Ian. We really appreciate I know how you guys like to see real animals and critters, so it was awesome you guys could bring them. Thanks, Robbie, for all your research. Jasper running tech. Stella doing what Stella does best. We have Isaac here in the background hiding from the cockroaches and the bees because he's not a big fan, but he's here. Uh, stay safe, and uh, we'll be talking to you guys next Friday. Bye.